Chapter 2 Jenny's Diary The Kazias left Boulder on the first stage of their overseas trip on the 21st of February 1900. They went to Albany by train and then went to the shipping agent of the Orient Line. They bought their third-class tickets for the steamship Oroya. While waiting for their ship to arrive from the eastern states, the couple spent their time with people from Boulder who were doing some shopping while on holidays. Jenny purchased a small Primus stove, a kettle, teapot, two cups and saucers, and everything else needed for making tea in their cabin. She also bought an exercise book for recording the details of their overseas trip. She made her first entry on the 21st of February 1900, and the last entry was on the 8th of August 1900, a day or so before arriving back in Australia. She had some problems with spelling the names of the many towns and places they visited. The Kazi is boarded the Oroya at midnight on the 25th of February. The sea was very rough for a few days after they left Albany, and although Jenny was sick on the first day of the voyage, she said she was all right after that. The Oroya must have been a large vessel, as Jenny recorded in her exercise book that there were 220 passengers on board. There were 70 in first or saloon class, and 90 in second class. She also said that the ship traveled an average of 348 miles in a 24 hours period. The 28th of February, 1900. They're very nice people with us, and I think it was just as well we went third class on the Orient Line, instead of by the Star Line. Everything is very nice, and you only want your own tea, sugar, teapot and kettle. We found our little kettle very handy. Madam uses himself by playing drafts and cards. I finished off reading The Woman in White, I could not leave it, so do not intend to start another long book for a few days. Two days later, she said that at seven o'clock that morning, an old Afghan had committed suicide by jumping overboard. He was blind and silly as well, and an Australian had tried to catch him, but could not keep his hold. They put down four lifebuoys and lowered a boat with six sailors to look for the Afghan. They turned the ship around and went back to the boys, but could not find him. We lost about two hours. The man's own countrymen on board did not seem to be sorry. We were to have a concert tonight, but it is postponed till tomorrow evening. The children skip a lot, and there are a lot of them on board. I did a bit of washing this morning. The concert was a great success, except for one or two stale recitations. The 4th of March, 1900 Sunday. We had rum steak and onions for breakfast, and afterwards there was a church service in the drawing room of the first class saloon. We had roast beef and plum pudding for dinner and then attended a Church of England service on deck. They hold mass often. We had cold ham for tea, which was very nice. Of course, that was all extra to what we get on weekdays. There was a service again on deck, and Matt and I went up there, but it came on to rain suddenly and we had to fly for shelter. March the 7th, 1900 We have seen land, and all hands seem light-hearted. We kept land in sight but did not drop anchor at Columbia until 12 o'clock at night. The coolies jumped on board and their chatter nearly drove me silly. The Oroya had to be cold, so dozens of us went ashore for the time they were doing it. March the 8th, 1900 The eight of us from our table all stayed at the Grand Oriental Hotel, which is the best one here. Matt and I had a lovely bedroom and all the doors open off the balcony. We all went down to supper and could only get sandwiches and lemon squashes and a shandy for the men. Our friends went for a walk, and Matt and I got into a rickshaw each, and off we went, with a coolie each for a horse. I was paralyzed with fright, I thought he would let me fall, so I said to Matt to make them stop. I wanted to get out and they said, It is all right lady, you sit back. I thought I would be safer if he would have a ride and let me pull him. He took us round the lighthouse, but I was glad when we got back. Matt gave the drivers a shilling each. The same two rickshaws were waiting for us at six in the morning, and I said I would not go with them. The coolies sleep on the doormat all night, in case we want anything. They're so clean. We went down and got a buggy and horse and went to the Cinnamon Gardens. The Cinnamon Gardens was so named because of the former cinnamon plantation in that area. In the year 1789, there were 289 acres of cinnamon trees. It is now an affluent suburb in Colombia, or Sri Lanka, and is a wealthy and affluent suburb, located three kilometers southeast from the city center. Nowadays Cinnamon Gardens is the location of the Prime Minister's Office, Independence Hall, Colombo Town Hall, 
and national museum, as well as numerous foreign embassies and high commissions. It is also the location of the Colombo Department of Meteorology and its observatory. Colombia is a beautiful place. Our ship sailed at 12 noon and the coolies were diving for money that the passengers were throwing into the water. Lady Brassy embarked with us and every day we see her down looking at her pets. She seems real plain. She was most likely the wife of Sir Thomas Brassy, Governor of Victoria from 1885 to 1900. We got out of Colombia after spending nearly five pounds. I bought a washing silk dress but I'm half sorry now, as I do not think it will be wide enough around me. A lot of retired English live there. Jenny said that it was getting very warm and that they would soon be entering the Red Sea. She took a great interest in Lady Brassy and said she nearly always watched her and her friend coming up from dinner in the first-class saloon. We had a concert in the evening. The sailors bring a piano down and take it away again as soon as it is finished with. A lot of people bought birds at Columbia. I may get one on the way home. The 14th of March, 1900 We passed the island of Perrin, or rather settlement, and they signaled that the Boers had retreated with heavy losses. The 15th of March, 1900 This morning the first thing we passed were the Twelve Apostles, all big rocks, and just now we are passing the Three Brothers Rocks. We are in the Red Sea. There is to be the fancy dress ball this evening in the first class saloon, and tomorrow evening our concert comes off. One of the first saloon ladies is going to sing. She sent two pounds ten shillings she had collected down in an envelope. She wanted the money to be given to the sailors who shift the piano up and down, the two sailors who sang, and the rest to the stewards. The 16th of March, 1900 the weather is beautiful. The ball in the first saloon was a great success. We had a good look at the different costumes. Lady Brassy looked very nice. I think she must have had 2,000 pounds worth of diamonds on her. Lady Brassy was dressed in a beautiful yellow satin. Our concert came off, and it was the best one of the three I have been to. March 17, 1900 this being St. Patrick's Day, the band was playing the wearing of the green. There are sports for the children today and a public dance tonight. All hands are invited. I heard them talking war news and by all accounts they say Roberts has been taken a prisoner. We have just passed a man of war ship. We passed seven steamers one afternoon and two or three more today. Being in the Red Sea, they say they all pass through here from India and China. We expect to get into the Suez about 10 o'clock in the morning. The 18th of March, 1900 There is so much excitement on board that you cannot tell it is a Sunday. We are just at the mouth of the Suez and are anchored. A lot of Arabs are on board selling every sort of curios you can think of. The Oro is taking a great lot of fresh vegetables on board, and the males are all speeding along to Port Said by rail. The P&O boat is just ahead of us and is quarantined as it has just come from Bombay where the plague is bad. We are following it and will go through without stopping. The little naked children run along each side of the ship and are very interesting and amusing to look at. The passengers throw oranges out to them, and I bought lovely oranges here at 24 a shilling. It is about 6 o'clock and we are anchored again at Ismalia, midway in the Suez, and are putting off 16 first saloon passengers and have taken in about 25 more for Naples. As soon as the launch came alongside, I said, Look at that lady, she has got some Vitus dance, and sure enough she had. She was the Duchess of Cumberland and she and her doctor, who had been traveling for 12 months, were returning home with her being no better. They had to leave her until all the luggage came on board. We had tea and left for Venice by train. The 23rd of March, 1900 I saw Mount Strom below and the smoke coming out of the volcano. We might have seen fire too, only for the mist. The sight of Mount Vesuvius was lovely, and we saw the blaze quite plainly. The houses seemed quite close. I would not like to live there. We saw some of the houses in Naples propped up with iron bars, where there had been an earthquake at some time past. We saw a good deal of Naples. Our guide walked us around until the train left. The square was something lovely. Also the Royal Duchess on board. I heard that she could not walk. 
So now we have some titled personages on board. Matt was telling me he had a cousin who lost his life while helping to dig the Suez Canal. Work on the Suez Canal in Egypt began in 1859 and was open for navigation some 10 years later. March 19, 1900 At about 3 o'clock in the morning, we were woken up with the horrible noise of the Arabs calling the ship, so Matt and I hurried up and got washed and dressed. We were on deck before 4 o'clock and went on shore to get out of the coal dust. We went into this place run by some old Turkish people where we got a very nice cup of coffee and such a lot of sweets. I had to leave all mine except for a few I put in my pocket. We sat there for a good while, then walked around and met an Australian. A lot of Mad's countrymen live here, but they were all on duty. One came to the boat looking for him. They were telling Matt that he could easily get a billet there, as he could talk English. Porset is a very large place, and I would not like to live there for anything. After the women here are married, they wear such peculiar dress. You can only see their eyes, and they seem to have a muscle on their nose. Most men and women are fairly large. There are people of all nations here and a lot of Italians. I think they have an English hospital here. On 22nd of March 1900, Jenny said that up to then they had had a good trip with only one rough day. Matt called her at 4 o'clock in the morning so she could see the Straits of Messina, and a little further on he called her again to look at the town of Etna. They arrived in Naples at about 5 p.m. It rained heavily for a couple of hours and made the landing rather miserable. We all went off in the launch, Lady Brassy and all. When we got to the wharf we all got our luggage off and went through Customs Palace with the police at every entrance, and the statuary was most beautiful. We stayed nearly two hours in Rome. We walked about the streets and saw a lot of beautiful buildings and bought a lot of views. We had to change trains three times from Naples to Venetia. I do wish I could speak Italian. Matt speaks it very well. The 24th of March, 1900 we saw a lot of snow-capped mountains while traveling from Naples to Venetia and some lovely green country. Venetia is a beautiful place. We are staying at a large hotel called Albergo Vapor. We lost our way from the dining room to our bedroom. The next morning after breakfast, the guide went about with us all day. He was such a nice old man. He first took us through the picture gallery of olden times and explained it all to us. I have a book with it all in English. We saw all the principal shops and then had lunch. And after afternoon tea, we went on board the Austrian boat, and then all through the St. Mark's Cathedral. There were a lot of bishops, priests and people, and several altars there. We went all through the prisons of olden times, and then went up St. Mark's Tower. It took 400 years to finish that. We had our opera glasses with us and could see an island from the tower. This island is a cemetery and all the corpses are taken there by boat. Venetia consists of 800 islands. Matt and I were taken to this place in a gondola from the station for three francs. The foundation on the river edge cost more than the buildings. The streets are so narrow and everywhere we land or stay, we have rain. We have not had our guide today. I have been writing. We went for a promenade after lunch and lost our way, so we got a little schoolboy to guide us and I think he took us miles out of our way, opposite to where we were going. I said to Matt. I will be real glad when our own guide comes in the morning, and I will not begrudge his six francs a day anymore. That night we went to the Italian opera Piccolo. It was splendid. The theater, the band, acting, and singing, the scenery and dresses were lovely. The opera was all about love and jealousy. The 24th of March, 1900 While we were in the square we went all through a great warehouse. It was full of glassware and everything is made on the premises. I have a big glass hat pin with my initials and the present year inscribed on it. I saw it getting made and the boss made me a present of it. He said he would not charge for the pin, but Matt could leave something for the workmen to get a drink. The 25th of March, 1900 The people here have got such rosy cheeks, but I am sure it must be damp as they all live just alongside water. It is what you might call winter, and everyone wraps up warm. I should think it would be very unhealthy here, but Matt says, no. We had some traveling companions all the way from Rome to Bologna, and they told us it had been a very severe winter, with 100 people dying every day in Rome. While we were on the square there were hundreds of tame pigeons and a man selling little penny bags of wheat. 
I bought one, and they flew up onto our hands to eat the wheat. There is a heavy fine if you are known to kill a pigeon or hurt it. The nurse girls in the square amused the little children with feeding the pigeons. We met several different college boys at walking. The ladies here dress just like Australians and seem to have such beautiful hair and teeth. Met got a telegram from his sister to ask him to let them know when to meet us. We were anchored from the Friday till Tuesday waiting for the boat. We could have gone on by train, but Met said he meant to spend a week in Venetia, so I said we might as well stay here before going home. This is supposed to be one of the prettiest cities in the world. I often hear English spoken. All nationalities are here. I think a lot of the Italians understand a good bit of English. The very poor is carrying an umbrella and the girls go out with no hats on. We are going to St. Mark's tonight. The 26th of March, 1900. It is drizzling rain. We went all through the museum and saw relics as far back as the year 900. Afterwards, we visited five different cathedrals and walked on the graves of many kings and bishops and afterwards visited the cemetery. Venetia only started to have a cemetery in the last century. We could not get into the German and English part as it was locked. In the evening we went to the circus. The 27th of March, 1900 The weather is beautiful. We went to a kind of museum and saw all the armor of war used in olden times. Afterwards, we went through a lace firm and saw some lovely things and all the girls at work. The firm gives work to over 4,000 people. They make you pay for visiting those firms. We are leaving Venetia tonight at 12 for Trieste in the steamer Arjas Kampkata. The 28th of March, 1900 Arrived in Trieste at half past 7 a.m. and I was so dead tired from Venetia and thought I was to have a rest in Trieste, but no rest for the wicked. Our big box had been sent on for Naples and our first weary tramp was to the station to see after that. It had just arrived the night before we did. It was a good thing we did stay in Venetia or we would have been worried thinking that it was lust. We had a lot of forms to fill in in different rooms to go through. There were a couple of little glasses broken in our luggage. We took the box to our hotel. We went to Wensler in person's place and the missus was in bed. She sent word afterwards to say how sorry she was that she had missed us. About half an hour afterwards, three of Matt's old friends came up the stairs to see him. They all wanted him to go to their place first. They were living at Zlorin when his father died. It takes 24 hours in a steamer to get to Zlorin from here. It was raining very hard when we got to Trieste and talk about cold. I would sooner have had it 110 degrees in Boulder. We went to a place near where Matt used to work in the fields. We met two of the men who used to work with him. They are also kind and I'm so sorry I cannot speak their language. Driest is a well-built place with plenty of beautiful shops. Drapery is cheap, but food is not anything as cheap as it had been when Matt left home. Two ships came in and dozens of men from it came to the wine shop to see Matt. He knew some of them after 20 years and I could see he is very much liked. Matt speaks Italian fluently, they tell me. I'm going to try and learn Italian as I think it is the easiest. They speak it nearly everywhere on the continent. The 29th of March, 1900 It is raining and the weather is miserable. Matt and I went down to one of his friends to dinner and coming home I thought I would freeze. I said to Matt, for God's sake keep on the sheltered side of the street. The next day I bought a nice warm jacket and a fur for my neck. The housemaid told me that in yes, the weather all through March is one day fine, and three days rain, and on account of the weather, I will not be able to have a good look at the place tonight. I'm going to bed and will have a good read and let Matt go out on his own. I told him he could stay out as long as he liked. The dressmaker is coming at six to fit my dress on again. It is the summer silk dress I bought at Columbia. We went all through the post and telegraph office today. It really is made in the most beautiful style I have ever seen. The statue of the Emperor of Austria is lovely. It was made in Vienna and the Emperor used to spend some time every day looking at its progress. Afterwards, we visited a cook's place. He cooks for the royal family or any nobility that come to Trieste. He showed us a photo where he seated 200 people. He was paid 1,100 pounds and found everything for it himself. If there are only about 20 to seat, they go to his place and when there are more he goes to some of their big houses. 
He said he sometimes earns a hundred pounds in a week then does nothing for a fortnight. He showed us two thousand pounds worth of things he has got. He would hit the glasses with his fingers and they would ring. We had a very nice meal there and his lady smoked with the men. Mitt said he was vexed with her for smoking in front of me. The cook has about four gold medals from different people. He told us that he is going to a christening on Sunday to be godfather, and is giving the child a cup worth 70 pounds. It is not raining today for a wonder, but talk about a cold wind, it would cut you into. Afterwards, we visited another lady and had tea with her. She was very nice, but she had only buried her brother the day we arrived, so was sad. Her husband is first cook on board the Austrian mail steamer to England, and is hardly ever home. She had such a beautiful furnished home and such lovely dresses. The dressmaker and the bootmaker came to the hotel. Matt is getting a pair of shoes made. I am just going to start packing. It is worse than hard work. The 31st of March, 1900 We left Trieste and saw beautiful scenery all the way. Matt was looking forward to showing me Pola where he served for three years in a man-of-war ship. As was our usual luck, it was raining hard just as we stopped there. The steamer had a lot of cargo and was staying for three hours. We went for a walk and saw a lot of man-of-war ships. The most pleasant part of those 24 hours to me was meeting an English lady. She was traveling with the Prince and Princess de Rowan of Bohemia, and their three children, Princess May, Prince Oscar and Charlie. She was their nurse and introduced me to them. We talk so much. I was sorry when it came time to leave as this was the first good English talk I've had except with Matt since leaving the Oroya. The prince, princess and the children all spoke English. April the 1st, 1900 At 10 o'clock we arrived at Zlerin. It was raining very hard but it stopped as luck would have it just as we got into Matt's sister's house and then it poured and talk about cold. However, after dinner most of us went visiting from one house to another. They all seemed to make so much of Matt. We went back to his sister's for tea. I must say this is a beautiful looking little place, and even after the rain there was not a trace of it afterwards, only little pools. The people here seem just to live and work for the bit they have to eat and for their clothes. They wear such peculiar dress. There are some very nice looking young chaps and girls. However, I will be glad to see Australian shores again. We slept in the house Matt was born in. His sister seemed cross because we would not stay with her, but her husband will be home on the 9th and three families were already there. These were relations of her husband. April the 2nd, 1900 Today they are all mostly at work, but we will have plenty visiting us in the evening. They are all very kind and would do any mortal thing for me, and I think everyone here in Slurin will know me before I leave. April the 4th, 1900 I have been here eight days today, and the time hangs very heavy, and it is a mistake not being able to talk the language, but it will not be for long now. We went to Sibinik and my sister-in-law, my niece and I, had our photos taken dressed in the traditional costume. They have nice schools here. The boys and girls do not go to the same school. Two young ladies have the girls' school, and they go on Saturday as well. They teach some fancy work and Thomasina has some nice work. She seems very intelligent. April the 8th, 1900 I got up this morning and made a great big plum pudding. The five of us had plenty and goodness knows who else they did not send a piece to. Matt and I went to church in the morning, and after dinner Matt went out and promised to meet me down the street but he got in a wine shop with a lot of pals and when he came to meet me he seemed to me to be top heavy. He is always telling me he means to get drunk, but he has not got drunk yet. The women here are very industrious. Eka, Matt's sister, is never idle and is always up hours before me. They spin all their own wool for their dresses. May the 4th, 1900 Matt and I and our sister-in-law went for a holiday to a place called Blos, the second best city in Dalmatia. When we arrived there the place was all bustle and confusion as the sixth was the biggest holiday in that place. The following morning, we went to church, and the style of the dresses was perfect. We went to the theater in the evening. It was crowded and as nice a theater to look at as I have seen. The acting and costumes were very good, and Eka used to amuse me the way she was taking everything in. May the 6th, 1900
The holiday has arrived and you can hardly move. I saw hundreds of different costumes. There was a procession that looked very imposing. The band and fire brigade were first, and then girls from their schools, and their teachers, the boys, and their masters, the different lodges, and their different costumes, and then about 100 priests, and four bishops. The next morning, we left on the steamer Lita, and as soon as we went downstairs on the steamship, I saw a lot of English newspapers lying about on the table that were as late as the 23rd of April. I was saying to Matt there had been some English on board, when a young man came out of his cabin and said, You speak English? He was a servant to a Scottish admiral. It was a four hours run to Sibnik, and we talked to each other all the way. Matt and my sister-in-law had plenty of Zlorins on board to talk to. After lunch the admiral had a talk to both of us. He seemed ill, and was traveling to Paolo in Italy to see if he could get rid of the rheumatism in his shoulder. The servant gave us all the English papers and some nice tea that was grown on the admiral's land in Colombia. When we arrived at Sibinik, our small steamer was just leaving, and we thought we would have to stay there all night. The admiral and his servant came along and said to Matt, I see our little boat has not come yet, I suppose you were raised in a boat? And Matt said, yes, and that many a time he was carried to Sibinik in the cradle and was never sick or sorry in his life. The admiral looked sad and shook hands with us and went away. That daily to stayed three hours in Sibinik. At last a sailing boat came, and there was a load of us about fifteen, and a baby and a cradle. The owner of the boat made us all pay steamer fare as he said it would cost us a lot to stay in Sibinik all night. That was quite true. May the 9th, 1900 Matt and I went up the highest hill in Zlorin. It was beautiful. We had the spy glasses and could see fourteen different townships. We were 1,000 feet above the level of the sea, and the various women passed with tubs of bluestone water on their head to sprinkle over the vineyards. First, they sprinkle all over the vines with sulfur, and then put bluestone over them three times, and sulfur again to kill the disease. There used to be none of the disease in Met's time. If they did not do this at the end of the year, they could have nothing for all their hard work. The 10th of May, 1900 a party of us left to see the Krakow waterfalls and we had lunch in the boat. It was about five in the evening when we arrived and we explored it all in an hour. There were various flour mills and the big Budapest electric plant and the large water pump. Everything was carried on by the force of the water. All of Sabinik and some other towns are supplied with water and electric light from Gurkha. For three miles up the river the water was fresh and we used to dip a glass in over the side and drink it. We arrived back at Korkula about 7 o'clock, and it was a beautiful place. It had one large and wide street and some beautiful buildings. The street was better than any I have seen since Naples. We bought cheese and fried fish and they lit a fire and made me a cup of tea, and we all had a real good supper. There was a fair wind, and off we started for the 15-mile run arriving back at Zlorin at half past two in the morning. Us three women lay under the deck and had a sleep. The Krika waterfall is the best I have seen so far. You can see it a long time before arriving there. It looks like sheets of white wool, and the noise when you arrive is terrible. It is a great place for the fever and ague. Everywhere is lovely and green. We passed big rocky hills and large caves. One of them goes right through the mountain to the other channel. Hundreds of years ago, bush rangers camped in the large cave. There are Greek churches in all the large towns. They are like the Church of England as their ministers marry. They do not shave and wear peculiar dresses. There were 400 men working at Greco new buildings and in another month there will be as many more putting up a large woolen mill and paper factory. The 11th of May, 1900 We started out for Pagora. One portion of it is Mott's property and it was very hard climbing over the rocks. We spent till lunch time picking the flowers of plants to make insectobane. This was made into a liquid and used to spray and kill insects. We filled two bags and my sister-in-law went down the street and sold them for ten florins. When I go to Sibinik, I'm going to buy something for myself with my money as a remembrance of the property. May 17, 1900 Matt and Eka have gone to finish picking the buds. She tries to get all she can, as they are preparing to sell the lot by auction, as there are a lot of debts to pay. The 23rd of May, 1900 
Madanai and his eldest sister went to Sibenik to say goodbye to her husband and family, as he was on the steamer Celine from Trieste. I bought a pair of earrings as a remembrance of Zlorin. The 24th of May, 1900 Nine of us set sail for Votus to say goodbye to Matt's youngest sister and her husband and family. Votus was all music and life on account of it being the biggest holiday for the year. We have all but finished with Slurin. The 29th of May, 1900 We left Slurin and caught the steamer Lita and came as far as Pola with the ship. We stayed there for two days, and the head steward in the first saloon was from Zlorin, and he gave me an English book to read out of the library, which was a great thing for me. He lent me three more to read at Pajora, and to return to him when we arrived at Trieste. I enjoyed myself very much at Pajora, looking at the man of warships and the soldiers and sailors drilling and marching. The place was all life. June the 1st, 1900 we arrived at Trieste, and there as usual, there were a lot of Matt's friends waiting for him. We went to the same place we stayed at when we arrived, and they all seemed so glad to see us again. Trieste is different to what it was two months ago. Everyone is in summer costumes, and the dresses are beautiful. We bought a new traveling trunk, as ours got all smashed coming from Naples to Trieste. We are just going to see a place called Miramar. June the 2nd, 1900 we have just been to see the Miramar Castle. It is about 12 miles out of Trieste, Austria. We hired a buggy for four hours, and when we arrived it was just 10 minutes to 12, and we could not go upstairs until 2 o'clock. But we explored all the outside scenery, which was lovely and by that time, it was a quarter to two. The caretaker explained everything in German, and afterwards to me in English. There was a cathedral in the castle where the emperor's son was married and the ceilings and the floors nearly always matched, and there were great collections of Chinese, Japanese, and Indian items, and in fact from all nations. We went through guest chambers, conversation room, reception room, summer, and winter dining rooms. We also went through Queen Charlotte's bedroom, and dressing room, and then the throne room. The scenery in the Castle Miramar far excelled anything we saw in Venice. June the 3rd, 1900 one of Matt's friends invited us to be at his place by 8 o'clock in the morning to go and see the cemetery. We hired a buggy for the morning that cost about one and six in English money. We only went through a part of the cemetery as it would take two days to go through the Turkish, Greek and Protestant part. Some of the tombstones and railings altogether cost six thousand pounds. We then had a drink and went on to the slaughter yards. They kill forty head in ten minutes and clear all away, and then kill forty more. There were two doctors and a policeman inspecting and marking each one inch in, and the Jews keep their own place and I did not care for that part much. Coming back the drive was very nice and we passed many foundries. June the 4th, 1900 We are now in Trieste and the weather is dull and raining. We are going to have dinner with our friends and say goodbye to them. We leave Trieste en route for Vienna at a quarter past eight this evening. We arrived in Vienna on 5th June, and after spending 12 hours there, we started for some place where we saw the Emperor's castle. It is like a large square and the people all walk backwards and forwards. We saw the room where anyone can going to write or pray to the Emperor to do them a favor. We saw a lovely church. It was built on the spot where the Emperor was nearly stabbed, only for a poor beggar catching the arm of the man who was going to kill him, and they built the church in memory of it. The beggar and his family were made comfortable, and the man who tried to stab the emperor was shot there and then. If we had gone back and stayed over Sunday in Vienna, we would have seen all the graves and corpses of Frank Joseph family. They are preserved just as in life. The royal church is joined to the castle, and you can visit on Sundays or Tuesdays for so many hours. June the 6th, 1900 we arrived at Leplitz and Mr. Hun was at the station, but it was our luck to miss him. The station master put our luggage away safely, and a man took us right to Albert Hahn's place, and there we were made very welcome. Leplitz is a lovely place, all gardens and beautiful walks, fish ponds, and baths and beautiful buildings. June the 7th, 1900 we had breakfast and as the weather was rather dull, I wrote a long letter to a friend in Boulder City. We had a very nice dinner, soup, poultry and sweets. 
After dinner, we visited old Mr. Han first, then went to the post and inquired if there were any letters. There weren't any. I posted my letter and then we visited Mr. Marcus Han. We were made welcome. We then went to a large lake and threw some bread to the fishes. There were beautiful large white swans and some small black ones. We visited the cathedral and then went home and had some tea. Afterwards, Mr. A. Han, his two daughters, and Matt and I went to the theater to see Fedora. The acting was splendid, and the dress is lovely. June the 8th, 1900 Old Mr. Han has just brought me watches as presents for Fred and May and for Matt and me. In the afternoon, we went in a tram for a long ride to a place called Spilhawton. There were such lovely and beautiful gardens. Coming back in the tram, we found out the conductor could speak in Italian, so Matt was at home again. When we arrived back home, we had a lovely tea. Earlier, we passed several glass factories and it would be hard to say which was the best. We visited a dairy and there were such a lot of fat cows and a lot of women and children there. We saw such a lot of young goslings, which will be a terrible size by Christmas. The place where we went to this afternoon was flooded once, and houses and stones were washed away and three lives lost. June the 9th, 1900 The weather is beautiful. Mr. Albert Hahn and Matt and I went to an open-air concert where the music was choice. After lunch, we were going to go in a buggy to Shaw Old Bike, but old Mr. and Mrs. Hun could not stand the air, and besides he thought it would cost too much money when we could see just as much in Leplitz. We went for a walk again with the old couple, and after tea, a long walk with Helen Hahn. The 10th of June, 1900 The weather is still beautiful. We have just been up a big hill and had a splendid view of Leplitz and the surrounding districts and we were quite close to the Franz Joseph Castle. While we were on the hill we could hear the lovely music from the concert and we bought various views of Leplitz. There are such a lot of milk carts drawn along the street by two large dogs. In the afternoon Matt and I and Albert and Helene Hahn and two friends went in a tram to a place called Squa Hare and from there a long tramp to a place called Mary Sign. We passed through fields of clover and we also found juries and glassworks and the central electricity plant. My word, they gave us the most terrible walk we had for many a day. We came to a place called Probst and Grandpu after, and then climbed up a mile of steps. There was a lovely rotunda there and dozens of people having tea and coffee and beer and milk. Our company had beer while Met had wine and I had milk. We could see for miles through our opera glasses. Another mile walk and we would have been in Germany. We visited a big cathedral, the largest I have seen, and I have seen a great many. Altogether our afternoon outing cost two shillings, and if we had hired a carriage for the same amount of enjoyment, it would have cost ten shillings. Old Mr. Han did not believe in us taking a carriage, so they sent these young people off with us, and Met complained more about the walk than I did. We were walking for five hours. We came home by tram. Old Mr. Hahn was telling us about a lady who came from Melbourne to Carlsbad to be cured in the baths. He said she was so fat she could hardly move and had to have water pumped out of her stomach. The doctor gave her permission to walk in the garden, but he did not think she would get better. However, she did, and old Mr. Hahn who was sitting next to her helped her and later she gave him a pair of sleeve links made from Melbourne stone. He said she got quite cured and was quite thin when she left. His complaint is his liver, was brought on by drinking, and he has been to the baths every year since Ludwig left. He is going again when we leave. He is a very nice, kind old man. Leplitz is a great bathing place, but not so good as Carlsbad. Old Mr. Hahn was telling Ned that sometimes he can finish his ten baths in three days and come home, and sometimes it takes him three months. He just goes by the doctor's orders. There are a lot of people here both young and old, in invalid chairs. Albert Hahn was saying you could hardly get rooms in these places now but in the winter, half will be empty. The 11th of June, 1900 The weather is beautiful and I have let Matt go out on his own as I am tired after yesterday. Matt says the Leplitz trees will remain in his mind as long as he lives. Some of them are 30 yards in length. Mr. Ahan just received a postcard from his eldest son from Komatau, sending his best respects to us and to his uncle and aunt in Australia. He is about 14 miles from here.
serving his time as a soldier. We cannot book from here to Paris, we must go to Carlsbad, and then we can book straight through to Paris. We met a gentleman the other day, one Guzip Mainer, the tram conductor, and he could speak Italian well, so he called to see us yesterday morning, and he came again this morning. He said to Matt he would come in the afternoon, and we would go for a walk, and he has just arrived. Our English-speaking friend is coming this evening, and is going to bring his two daughters, and his wife. Our English-speaking Dutchman has broken his promise twice, but the Italian-speaking Dutchman came. So Matt and he and I and Ahan went in the tram and then walked to a place called Bergschlossen, up on a hill. We had a rest up there and drank beer, wine and milk. We could see the monument of a man who first stopped slavery, and we could also see the castle where the war was in 1857, and also the 1866 war between Austria and Prussians. We saw some lovely ducks, geese, and goslings up at the farmhouses. We walked back to this close garden, and then home. We would have left Leplitz yesterday only for waiting for our box. Old Mr. Hahn is coming as far as Carlsbad with us. The 12th of June, 1900 The weather is still beautiful. Old Mr. Hahn and Matt and I have into the reading room, and I read the Times, and the caretaker gave us a New York Herald as late as 8th June. We had a drink of hot Leplitz water. All the visitors drink it. It is always flowing. We came home and are going out again this afternoon. In the evening Matt and I and Helene Hahn and Mr. Hahn Sr. went to an open air and promenade concert. The music was beautiful. Afterwards, we went for a walk in this close garden and then home. The military and marine music at Schloss Garden was very good. We had such a nice supper and looked out the window till about 11 o'clock and then retired. The 13th of June, 1900 Matt woke me about seven in the morning to tell me that our box had arrived. He went there early and had to come back as the station parcel office did not open till nine o'clock. Matt received the luggage all safe and got the big box off to Paris. We are leaving here at eight o'clock in the morning, and Mr. Hansinger is going as far as Carlsbad with us. We may stay overnight in Carlsbad, and we may not. We were four hours walking this afternoon and went up to the Schlossberg and came to the conclusion it was the best we had yet seen. We went all through the restaurant. The four little Hans were with us and we all had a drink. We could see the monuments of the wars in 1550, 1552, 1558, 1581, 1598, 1634, 1626, 1630, 1766, 1767, 1881, 1884, 1885, and the war between Russia, Prussia and Austria in 1856. We have just said goodbye to Mrs. Hahn Sr. The 14th of June, 1900 We went as far as Carlsbad and could not catch a train that day for Paris, only the express and in first class, so old Mr. Hahn told us to go on the one that leaves at one o'clock tomorrow. The 15th of June, 1900 It is raining heavily in Carlsbad. When we arrived at the station we found our train was gone and we must wait another day. We had a good walk around Carlsbad and saw all the springs and baths and drank some of the water. The 16th of June, 1900 We were in plenty of time for our train and when we got to Stuttgart we had to wait there for five hours for our train. We had to pass Bavaria, the part where the late Empress was born, and passed under a tunnel that was 933 yards long. We paid £3.12 shillings for a second-class ticket from Carlsbad to Paris. We arrived at Mitchfield at a quarter to three. We could see the flag on the boundary between Germany and Austria. You very soon know when you were in a new country by the names and the money. In Germany, the names nearly all end in Berg, while in France it is mostly law or Laville. It was a nasty shaky train, and the dirtiest journey I have had. We had to change countries twice and the trains three times. We met five people who spoke English and one young gentleman was very kind and gave us a lot of valuable information about planning for the rest of our trip. We have just crossed the River Rhine. The 18th of June, 1900
We arrived in France at ten minutes past eight in the morning and had the same six passengers, two ladies, and four gentlemen in our carriage all the way from Stuttgart. At Evrincourt we had to get out with all of our luggage and have it examined by the customs, and then we went back to our carriage again. Most of the farmhouses in France have one story, whilst in Germany, Italy, and Austria, they have two. France seems to be a lovely country. The cattle look in good condition, and the vineyards and fields as well. It is nine o'clock and there are men and women fishing in a big river and such lovely flowers growing almost beside the train, and great flocks of geese and ducks with someone minding them. We went through fruit-growing places and have just passed the first long tunnel in France. End of chapter 2